The hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Today's investigative hearing is entitled, Hijacking Our Heroes, Exploiting Veterans Through Disinformation on Social Media. Over the past three years, there has been an increasing awareness of how foreign actors have sought to infiltrate and influence our elections. Manipulation of social media networks, a major source of news and information, has become a tool of influence. We are here today to consider how such foreign actors specifically target and take advantage of our veterans and veteran service organizations on social media. During today's hearing, we'll hear about internet spoofing. Spoofing is defined as the act of disguising an electronic communication, such as email and texts, from an unknown source and make the communication look like it is from a known, trusted source. This can happen either by creating a fraudulent account or by stealing a real account and is one of the primary tactics by which foreign actors infiltrate social media networks. Spoofing includes the creation of fake social media accounts using a stolen photograph or name, thereby imitating an actual person in order to gain trust and credibility. In other words, someone may be looking at what they believe is a legitimate veteran service organization's Facebook page or Twitter feed when in reality, a bad or fraudulent actor is masquerading as the real thing. Social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter have enormous reach through their millions of daily users. The steady growth of internet access and mobile technology has made social media accessible to most people around the world. However, that also means that dishonest individuals or even entities associated with foreign governments can now easily reach into unsuspecting American homes to spread disinformation. As a recent Senate Intelligence Committee report detailed, Russian efforts to infiltrate our social media networks actually increased in the aftermath of the 2016 election and are likely to continue to increase through 2020. Let me be clear, this issue has nothing to do with censoring certain political views or removing content based on partisan basis of on, on partisan bias. This is what this is a, this hearing is about impersonation and stealing veterans' voices. Pretending to be a veteran for any reason is shameful, but it is especially it is especially shameful when such deception is used to spread disinformation. Veterans wield considerable influence and credibility in their communities, earned by virtue of their selfless sacrifice uh, and, and service to our country. Whether in Riverside, California or Washington, D.C., veterans are listened to because of their experience and sacrifice. But that esteemed trust in our veterans is now being hijacked by foreign imposters online and used to spread harmful disinformation, political propaganda, and fake news. Foreign actors are stealing veterans' voices and images in order to influence political opinions heading into an election year. Unsuspecting citizens could have their political judgment swayed by foreign voices posing as American veterans. By impersonating veterans, these foreign actors are effectively eroding the hard-earned power and integrity of veterans' voices. Social media platforms play an important role in public discourse, and I continue to believe in protecting our freedoms of speech and innovation. But there is a very real and growing problem here, and we need to determine how to strike the balance between shielding platforms from frivolous lawsuits and ensuring election security uh, and sanctity of our veterans' voices in civic discourse. The platforms themselves need to do more to eliminate the issue of internet spoofing, and if they don't, then Congress will need to step in more directly. So today, we are going to hear from Christopher Goldsmith, representing the Vietnam Veterans of America. Uh, in fact, the Vietnam Veterans of America itself was spoofed, leading Mr. Goldsmith to conduct years of research into how veterans are targeted by foreign actors online. We will also hear 
So Mr. Goldsmith, welcome today. We also will hear about the magnitude and scope of the spoofing problem from a data scientist from Graphica, a firm specializing in the analysis of social media networks who has completed uh, extensive research examining this issue. Finally, two of the most significant social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, will tell us about their efforts to combat the growing problem of foreign actors spoofing on their networks. This hearing will explore some key, top, uh, some key, key questions. First, how extensive is the problem of veteran spoofing? What are the types of manipulation and how are veterans affected? Second, are social media platforms doing enough to detect and remove bad actors? What more can the platforms do to prevent this manipulation, especially given the, uh, given the impending 2020 election? Finally, what, ro what role should the government have in ensuring that veterans and others are not harmed by the manip manipulation of social media networks? Are the FBI and others in law enforcement in the law enforcement community performing a strong and appropriate role in ensuring that our nation's laws are followed? The issue of protecting our elections from foreign influence is one of critical importance to all Americans, and preserving the power of veterans' voices should be of equal concern to us all. And with that, I'd like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Dr. Rowe for five minutes for any opening remarks that he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this past Monday, November 11th, was Veterans Day. In our hectic world, we sometimes fail to take the time to consider that we owe our freedom to those who have protected our freedoms. From 1776 to today, Americans of all walks of life have answered the call to fight for and defend this nation. And one veteran I met Monday, uh, last Friday, I mean, at uh, Colonial Heights Middle School in Sullivan County, Tennessee, was one of the last 11 survivors of the torpedoing of the USS Indianapolis. And I saw this gentleman in his mid-90s who looked up at the screen, and when they showed his ship, and a tear came down his face, and I saw, here's a man who spent four days in the water, if you haven't read about the USS Indianapolis, and, and survived that terrible um, a torpedo wing to live a normal life, raise six children, and, and basically help create the country that I was able to, along with many, many others, that I was able to grow up in. I want to thank Mr. Smith for that and his family. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to explore the misappropriation of veterans' identities for the dissemination of fake news and political propaganda, romance scams, and commercial fraud. And I will say that I'm just glad my sweet mother is no longer around to read my Facebook fa page to find out how awful her son turned out. Um, this is a complicated issue that can be and has been approached from several different angles in Congress. Our colleagues and other committees with different expertise and hours have focused on foreign influence through social media. I intend to use my time today to understand the extent to which the peddlers of propaganda and unscrupulous scammers target veterans and their families and learn what they can do to defend themselves. We want to shed light on the issues impacting veterans, help them understand the risks associated with using social media, and direct them to resources to empower them to protect themselves and their families online. From our witnesses, I'm interested in learning whether veterans are at higher risk for being targeted for propaganda and what veterans can do uh, to identify propaganda. Um, that was an issue raised in, uh, in the Vietnam Veterans uh, recent report, which will be a topic of today's conversation. Another issue raised in VVA's report concerns romance scams, many of which, according to VVA, originate in West Africa. According to the 2017 AARP report that examined fraud targeting veterans, 28% of veterans surveyed reported being the target of a romance scam over the past five years, while 26% of non-veterans surveyed reported being targets of romance scams during the same period. In other words, there was no statistical difference between the rates of romance scams, uh, frauds between veterans and non-veterans. I'm interested in whether our witnesses have studied the targeting of veterans for romance scams on social media platforms and whether they have evidence that veterans are more uh, or less targeted than non-veterans. The evidence is clear that veterans have their identity misappropriated and that they, like other social media users, could be targets for propaganda or scams. Therefore, I want to hear from our witnesses about what they believe these, uh, their platform's role is in preventing the misappropriation of veterans' identities and stopping propaganda and scams. Education and outreach are the most effective means of protecting against financial exploitation. Therefore, 
We must empower veterans with the information necessary to make an informed choice about whether the benefits of social media are worth the risks and to make them aware of available resources to protect themselves. It's my understanding that both Facebook and Twitter provide information and training on social media safety. I hope to hear more about how they're partnering with other private entities, including the veteran service organizations, to disseminate existing materials and new resources to their members, including veterans. I will conclude with this. No government agency or private entity can fully protect veterans from potentially malicious actors online or otherwise. Veterans must be their own shield and their own first line of defense. To veterans watching this hearing, please take a critical look at posts, news feeds, and messages because not surprisingly, not everything online is true and accurate. If you are contacted by someone you do, you, you do know or a company asking you for money um, or sensitive information, take a moment to pick up the phone and call that person or company to verify it was sent by them. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Um, I will now uh, call on the panelists uh, to uh, present their testimony. Um, uh, first, uh, Mr. Christopher Goldsmith, Chief Investigator and Associate Director of Policy and Government Affairs uh, of Vietnam Veterans of America. Welcome, Mr. Goldsmith, and you have five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Dr. Rowe, and the distinguished members of, the, of this committee. We at Vietnam Veterans America, and I personally, are deeply grateful for your decision to hold this hearing and for your commitment to ensuring that America addresses foreign-born cyber threats against service members, veterans, uh, our families, and survivors. My name is Christopher Goldsmith, and I am the Chief Investigator and Associate Director for Policy and Government Affairs at VVA. I served with the Army's 3rd Infantry Division as a forward observer and deployed for a year to Sadr City, Baghdad in 2005. Many of you know me for my work on the issue of helping veterans with bad paper discharges and for being the young guy representing VVA as we joined with our VSO partners to create and advocate for the passage of the Forever GI Bill. In an ideal world, these things would still be my primary focus here at VVA. VVA gave me the title of Chief Investigator out of, necessi uh, out of necessity. I took on this additional role when VVA came to realize that we were facing a series of foreign-born online imposters who were creating social media accounts and websites that were meant to trick our members and supporters. These imposters were, and still are, using the name and brand of our con congressionally chartered VSO to spread actual fake news that is meant to inflame national divisions. Since beginning our investigation, we've found and exposed election interference related to the 2020 presidential campaign by these foreign entities. VVA has documented what we believe to be campaign finance fraud with well-known Macedonian crooks tricking followers of the Vets for Trump PAC's Facebook page into sending political donations overseas via PayPal. These Macedonians had staged a hostile takeover of two pages originally owned by real American veterans and then used them to build up xenophobic hatred against four women of color in Congress and then tie them, the women of, in Congress, to Democratic 2020 presidential candidates. They also used these pages to spread disinformation about elections in New York, my home state. Separately, we discovered a host of foreign entities from Eastern Europe and the Asian Pacific selling counterfeit merchandise featuring VVA's trademark logo alongside racist political propaganda. We've found multiple entities from Russia, Ukraine, and Bulgaria who are purporting to be VVA on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, and Reddit. We've been tracking a bot network on Twitter which finds and follows veteran advocates like myself and my colleagues behind me and tries to blend in with the veterans community by retweeting official government accounts veterans organizations, and political organizations like the NRA. People who then follow these accounts get automated messages in broken English with suspicious links. We've discovered that Nigeria hosts a massive organized criminal empire, which uses the names and photos of troops and veterans to lure Americans into romance scams. Because some of the names and photos are of troops killed in action, their Gold Star families are re-traumatized as their deceased loved ones continue to be used as bait for financial fraud. Some of the victims whose names get used are your own colleagues, veterans who serve in Congress. In one example, Congressman Lee Zeldin, a fellow Long Islander, 
had photos of him and his kids exploited to make it look like he was a widower in search of new love. We've done a close analysis of the infamous Russian ads that were released by the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Among them were at least 113 ads directed at veterans, or which used veterans as props in Russia's mission to divide Americans. Facebook's micro-targeting allowed these Russian entries, uh, entities to specifically target the followers of AMVETS, DAV, IAVA, PVA, VVA, Wounded Warrior Project, and a host of veterans organizations which operate on the political spectrum, like Concerned Veterans of America and Vietnam Veterans Against the War. At least two of the ads on Facebook featured a friend of mine, an advocate for veterans and service dogs. Those of you who have been on this committee for a while knew Captain Luis Carlos Montalvan and his K-9 Tuesday. Our friend died by suicide in December 2016, but he lives on as evidence in Russia's insidious campaign against us. If the committee would indulge me for a moment, and I'm asking you, the members, would those of you in the room who remember the reports from 2015 of the so-called cyber caliphate, an affiliate of ISIS, sending threatening messages to families, please raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, for the record, one person. Now, those among you in the, this time of rapid fire breaking news that has overwhelmed us all, have, who has had the opportunity to read the follow-up stories which revealed that these terroristic threats were actually made by Russian hackers who were pretending to be ISIS? No one, exactly. It's important to note that the military families were not chosen at random. One was a reporter at military.com. The others were prominent members of the, the community of military and veteran advocates. I want to emphasize this point. Russian hackers who were pretending to be ISIS sent terroristic threats to advocates and reporters who appear before or report about this committee. In a flurry of news, it seems like hardly anyone even knows that happened. We've detailed our findings in a 191 page report that is sitting in front of you, uh, and it's publicly available at our website, vba.org slash troll report, which we encourage all of you to read. Thank you for inviting us to appear before the committee today, and I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you might have to pose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. Uh, next is uh, 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 Dr. Vladimir Barash, Science Director of Graphica. Welcome, Mr. Barash. Five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Rowe, and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for holding this hearing today. I am the science director of, of Graphica, a network analysis company that examines how ideas and influence spread online. This is a problem I have been working on for many years. My PhD dissertation at Cornell demonstrated how an idea can reach critical mass simply by gaining enough supporters in the right online communities, no matter how true or false it is. Even the most outlandish rumor that reaches critical mass will go viral and become extremely difficult to disprove. In the years since, at Graphica, I have had the opportunity to apply my research in studying a wide array of real disinformation campaigns, including the work we did with our Oxford University colleagues for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, analyzing the Russian disinformation campaigns surrounding the 2016 U.S. presidential election. These operations are rapidly evolving. Early campaigns we observed and analyzed targeted individuals online at random using easily discoverable methods. Newer methods use sophisticated cyborg approaches that synergize large-scale automated operations with precisely crafted disinformation injection and hijacking efforts by human operators. The goal of these operations is not simply to go viral or to have a high Nielsen score, so to speak, but rather to influence the beliefs and narratives of influential members of key American communities. The effects of these operations aren't confined to the digital space. By targeting individuals directly and by leveraging social media to organize offline events, they seek to produce chaos and harm in the homes and streets of our country. These online campaigns have long targeted U.S. veterans and military service members. Foreign information operations against our men and women in uniform are a persistent threat ongoing since at least 2011. These operations have played out on social media, in the cyber domain, and on alternative websites and news media focused on the veterans community. 
These operations show no sign of stopping. A previous study demonstrates that information operations by Russia's Internet Research Agency increased dramatically after the 2016 elections. Recent work has identified additional state actors, such as Iran, China, and Saudi Arabia, using information operations to target communities and topics of interest. Information operations on social media exploit societal cleavages in U.S. veterans and military communities and work to promote narratives that American democracy is irrevocably broken. Attacks against our troops in the cyber domain manifest as malware and phishing campaigns, for instance, targeting veterans looking for employment. The pairing of disinformation with cyber attacks demonstrates the sophistication of these operations, which aim to manipulate our veterans through multiple channels simultaneously and negate the utility of any single defense against their efforts. Information operations intersect with domestic, hyperpartisan, and conspiratorial content, both on the right and on the left. The structure of our own public sphere creates the cracks through which bad actors target us. Domestic conspiracy theory accounts act as perfect amplifiers for foreign disinformation content, pushing it to a larger audience of Americans and situating it in a familiar context. Our findings so far, aided by proactive detection and transparency efforts by social media platforms in the last two years, have shed light on the nature of information operations against our veterans and military service members. But as a scientist, my inclination is also to highlight some of the key known unknowns of this topic. When it comes to the scope of operations, the data available so far allow for a piecemeal approach to a multifaceted problem there are still data gaps in our understanding of the issue. When it comes to the impact of operations, we need to answer the crucial question of how follows, retweets, and page clicks translate to the changing of hearts and minds. What we do know, however, clearly demonstrates that we need a whole-of-society approach to protecting and supporting the communities most targeted by foreign actors online. Only by acting in concert can we stop a concerted threat to the troops who have fought and still and always will fight for our freedom. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Barash, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Kevin Kane, Public Policy Manager of Twitter at Twitter, uh, welcome, uh, and you have five minutes to, uh, for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Rowe, and members of the committee. I'm grateful for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss how Twitter supports America's veterans and works to mitigate bad actors from abusing our platform. Twitter facilitates and amplifies the voices of veterans, both online and in our workforce. We see important conversations related to veterans issues play out on Twitter every day. And over the past six months, we've hosted more than 100 veterans for trainings in our offices. Just last week, in fact, uh, we hosted the Student Veterans of America uh, in our office to teach them how to better leverage Twitter to support their important work. The commitment to, Twitter, to Twitter's efforts to support veterans' causes and our employees with service backgrounds comes from the top, with our, executive, with our executives acting as model allies. It is not only a priority to get veterans in the door, but also to hire them at levels recognizing the experience they gain while serving in uniform. Our commitment is not solely limited to hiring. Our business resource group for veterans and military families, Twitter Stripes, works each day to share the veteran community's story both inside our offices and out. This group delivers programming that helps our employees understand the pride and challenge of service. We also have a close relationship with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and advise the agency on best practices to leverage the power of Twitter to better serve veterans who are at risk for committing suicide. Among other efforts, we supported the VA's suicide prevention campaign by badging the Be There hashtag with a custom emoji to elevate this important initiative on Twitter. We work each day to serve the public conversation and ensure all those who come to Twitter have a voice on the service. Over the last year, for example, we implemented dozens of product and policy changes to improve our ability to tackle the issues that undermine a healthy conversation, including abuse, harassment, malicious automation, and inauthentic engagement. We rely on collaborative partnerships with civil society, governments, 
and researchers to better understand and address these challenges. I provided more detail in my written testimony, but will briefly outline some of the most important work we are doing to fight online scams, combat coordinated manipulation, and provide transparency around foreign state-backed influence operations. First, in regard to preventing scams, in September of this year, we codified our prohibition against scam tactics. Under our policy, individuals using Twitter are prohibited from deceiving others and sending money or personal finan financial information via scam tactics, phishing, or other fraudulent methods. Individuals may not create accounts, post tweets, or send direct messages that solicit engagement in such fraudulent schemes. Examples of these prohibited tactics include sending money or personal financial information by operating a fake account or by posing as a public figure or an organization, engaging in money flipping schemes, operating schemes that make discount offers to others where fulfillment of the offers is paid for using stolen credit cards, and posing as or implying affiliation uh, with banks or other financial institutions to acquire personal financial information. On the issue of platform manipulation, we have made significant progress in our work. In fact, since January of 2018, we have challenged more than 520 million accounts suspected of engaging in platform manipulation. To be clear, we define platform manipulation as disrupting the public conversation by engaging in bulk, aggressive, or deceptive activity. Finally, we strive for transparency by providing a publicly accessible archive of foreign state-backed influence operations. This archive currently contains more than 30 million tweets on accounts engaging in foreign influence operation originating in countries including Russia, Iran, China, among others. We made these accounts and their content available and searchable so the public, governments, and researchers can investigate, learn, and build media literacy capabilities for the future. Information operations are not new and predate social media. They continue to adapt and change as the geopolitical terrain evolves worldwide and as new technologies emerge. We are committed to continue our work in understanding how bad faith actors use our service. In closing, our work on this issue is not done, nor will it ever be. We continue to fight these threats while maintaining the integrity of people's experiences on Twitter and supporting the health of the conversation on the service. I appreciate the opportunity to share this work with the members of this committee. Mr. Chairman, I would again like to thank you for calling this important hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Uh, Mr. Nathaniel Gleischer, Head of Security Policy at Facebook, welcome, and uh, you have five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Rowe, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Nathaniel Gleischer, and I'm the Head of Security Policy at Facebook. My work is focused on identifying emerging threats and protecting our users from those threats. I have a background in computer science and law. Before coming to Facebook, I prosecuted cybercrime at the US Department of Justice and built and defended computer networks. All of us at Facebook are incredibly grateful to our veterans for their service and for the sacrifices they and their families make. We're proud that thousands of veterans and active duty military members use the Facebook family of apps to stay connected and share with their friends and loved ones. Facebook is also proud to invest in the veteran community through our hiring and by supporting veterans at Facebook, by providing career development and job search tools for veterans and military families, and by offering training and mentoring programs for veteran entrepreneurs. Through initiatives like our Military and Veterans Hub and our new partnership to advance veterans entrepreneurship, we offer a wide variety of resources to help veterans grow their businesses, develop new skills, and find job opportunities, both here at Facebook and elsewhere. Facebook is designed to help bring communities together and to do that in an authentic way. That's why we require people to connect on Facebook using the name they go by in everyday life. We don't allow people to use fake accounts, artificially boost the popularity of content, or impersonate someone else. We recognize, however, that there are bad actors intent on misusing our platform and some of those bad actors target individuals and groups that are considered trustworthy, like veterans. This can occur individually when a specific veteran is impersonated, such as in a romance scam, or organizationally 
when pages or groups are created to impersonate veteran-related organizations, usually for financial purposes, such as to sell merchandise or otherwise make money. Finally, we see foreign governments dis distort veterans' issues to sow division. This is less common than the previous two examples of financially motivated fraud, but any amount of this type of deception is too much. Our efforts to stop this inauthentic behavior, as well as other kinds of frauds and scams, have four components. First, our expert investigators proactively hunt for and remove the most sophisticated threats. Second, we build technology to detect and automatically remove more common threats. Third, we provide transparency and reporting tools to give users context about who they are speaking to or following online and to enable independent researchers and the press to conduct their own investigations and to expose bad behavior. And fourth, we work closely with civil society, researchers, governments, and industry partners so they can flag issues that they see and we can work quickly to resolve them. Combining these four strategies allows us to pursue what we call adversarial design, continually adopting our platforms to make them more resistant to deception and more conducive to authenticity. When it comes to scammers impersonating veterans on our platform in particular, we are testing new detection capabilities to look for certain techniques these scammers use to target individuals such as veterans. These capabilities help us more quickly detect and remove scammer accounts, often before people even see them. Unfortunately, Impersonation is not limited to veterans or veteran-related groups. That's why, to root out and remove these bad actors, we focus on patterns of behavior, the techniques and tactics these scammers rely on, not just content. This allows our approach to be flexible enough to combat impersonation of all kinds, and means that our teams can bring insights from protecting other communities to make sure we're as effective as possible when protecting veterans. One form of transparency that has been particularly useful to help expose false veterans organizations run from overseas is giving our users more information about who is running a particular Facebook page or account and from what country. Partnerships are also essential in our work to protect veterans. We work with veteran services organizations and others to educate the veterans community on how to handle impersonation. And we have dedicated channels for the Department of Defense and others affected by impersonation to report to us. We know that we face motivated adversaries in this space and that we have to continually improve our approach to stay ahead. We are committed to doing just that. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to hear your ideas and concerns and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I now will recognize myself for five minutes uh, uh, for questioning. Uh, my first question is uh, to Mr. Goldsmith and Dr. Barash. Can um, both of you talk to us about the significance or urgency of this problem? How does disinformation spread by foreign actors harm veterans? And what is the full scope of the impact uh, to our nation? Uh, Dr. Gold, uh, Mr. Goldsmith, go first, please. Thank you, Chairman, for the question. Um, one specific example of how this falsified news pushed by these fake VSOs can affect our members. Uh, in May of 2017, uh, Stars and Stripes reporter wrote a, a, a report about uh, what was then Trump's first budget. Uh, it was a true story. It was written by a reputable uh, outlet that we work with day in and day out, uh, and it, part of it mentioned how there was proposed budget cuts to certain disability benefits. Um, that true story was copied and pasted word for word, minus the name of the reporter, onto the website vvets.eu, which was based out of Bulgaria. And it was just using the same headline, the same text, but it was changing the date to make it look more urgent. Now, when we, when Vietnam Veterans America's members find out that something like uh, total and permanent disability benefits for those who are collecting Social Security or something, say those are, are going to be cut, uh, that has a profound effect on the, the real health 
of our members. When they are affected by that policy and they see a report like that and they think, oh my God, in a couple months I could be homeless mm. if this budget passes, you know, if, if this piece of the budget passes. And to, to be re-exposed over and over and over again to that sense of panic of, of real effects on your life can exacerbate things like PTSD, can exacerbate physical health conditions. Uh, and that's, I think, what really led VBA down this path into this investigation. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Barash. Thank you for the question, Chairman. Uh, I think there are two ways in which these operations really affect uh, our veterans and more broadly the population that those veterans influence. Uh, first and foremost, uh, they affect our veterans as they try to reintegrate into civilian life. Uh, our veterans are an influential member of American communities. They are trusted, they are respected, but they are also vulnerable in the context of the digital divide. And when they are looking for employment and are being targeted by malware, when they are looking to establish new relationships and being targeted by scams, uh, this breaks down the social fabric, the fragile social fabric that they are starting to build as they return uh, from military service and uh, have a life at home, and return to a life at home. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kane and Mr. Gleiser, given the potential harm to veterans, their families, and our nation, why shouldn't the spoofing threat be treated as seriously as other issues like copyright infringement? Why does it take so much longer to remove spoofed content uh, than copyrighted content. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Kane first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we take very seriously and have strong policies strictly against having a fake account, uh, which is something like using a stolen profile image, using a stolen bio, uh, uh, whether or not... Uh, I, I, excuse me, I realize you take it seriously, right. but why does it take so much longer to remove spoof content than copyright content? I don't have much time. I, I just need to understand why you're able to move copyrighted content faster, much more effectively than spoof content. Uh, Congressman, we do have effective and very uh, fast methods but of- you do remove copyrighted content much quicker. Why is that the case? We work to stay compliant with DMCA, which I do believe has- You're still not answering my question. Um, Mr. Gleischer, can you answer that question? Chairman, so we have automated systems that detect and remove billions of fake accounts every day, most of them before anyone has seen them. Fake accounts are the common underlying theme under all of these scams. And so we have automated systems that actually move very quickly to remove these fake accounts. One of the difficult challenges here, Mr. Chairman, is if someone reports an account, we respond very quickly. But often the question of what constitutes impersonation, we need to understand that and make sure we're taking correct action. But again, why is copyrighted content removed much more quickly than spoof content? Congressman, we have, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have specific systems in place in both cases, and we respond given the complexity of the environment and move as quickly as we can. It's something where we need to move more quickly, quite frankly. I still haven't heard an answer, a direct answer to my question. Um, I, my time is up. I now want to recognize Dr. Rowe for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you're old and ugly like I am, you know that romance is definitely a scam. So I don't, I've never even answered those. I don't worry about it at all. Um, you know, to show you how misinformation, Dr. Brash, you mentioned it. Uh, I was in Estonia a couple of years ago, and uh, we were having a, um, uh, there's a big uh, Russian uh, maneuvers just off, off, as you know, the Baltics. And uh, basically, a story was floated that a young Estonian woman on social media had been raped by a German soldier. It's totally fabricated. But it took a lot of getting, uh, you know, correcting to, to correct this misinformation. It rapidly spread throughout social media. So it is, it is a powerful tool. There's no question about it. And how you get that information out of there quickly. And I, I have some sympathy for you all here. It must be whack-a-mole trying to figure out what account is legitimate, what account is not uh, legit, is legitimate. And I don't know how you do that when someone puts an identity up. I tell my wife all the time, I get steaming mad when she reads my Facebook page. I said, it may be fake. Who knows if it's real or not? So don't get all, all worked up about it. So how do you know that? And, and again, to the chairman's question, I don't know how you rapidly do that. Can any of you are welcome to take that question? 
Congressman, thank you very much for that question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we want to try to avoid a whack-a-mole type uh, a situation here and take a very holistic approach in terms of how we deal with fake accounts. One of the common strategic approaches that we take is looking for coordinated manipulation, looking to see how various accounts are connected together to push out this type of content. And so we, we've invested heavily in terms of proactive detection of these coordinated accounts. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, over the last uh, year and a half, we've uh, found and challenged approximately 520 million accounts. This is as a result of our investment in automated detection systems to look for that uh, coordinated networks because, again, we want to massively disrupt these networks and not just focus on certain segments of where they seek to, to interfere with the conversation. Well, there's, there's no question that, um, and, and Mr. Cain, back to you since you answered that, uh, what has Twitter done to specifically educate veterans, users of the platform, about how they can protect themselves? Congressman, thank you very much for that question. The underlying issue of media literacy is something that's absolutely imperative. Uh, we certainly have a role uh, in, in making sure we are supporting the health of the conversation by getting rid of bad actors, by getting rid of these fake accounts. And one of the things uh, that we've done is, is, is make investments in partnerships with various organizations focused on media literacy. In fact, I have a copy of our last report that we did with the Organization of American States that we've published in several different languages to help keep people safe online, to help them better understand Twitter. And for any veterans who may be watching this today, if you go to blog.twitter.com, you can find these resources to help better educate the veterans community. And we're certainly committed in, in terms of partnering with the VSOs as well as the VA uh, in providing this information as well. I'm sure I've won a cruise on if I've just looked hard enough right here now. Uh, Dr. Brash, this is a three-part question quickly. First, are veterans targeted for scams at a higher rate than non-veterans? I think you've answered that. Secondly, are veterans targeted for propaganda at a higher rate than non-veterans? And do you have evidence for either one? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, Veterans are an influential uh, community in our social fabric online and offline, and as a result, uh, it is much more uh, effective to target them with uh, all kinds of operations, including propaganda. Um, we have done some, uh, we have performed studies that indicate that veterans are targeted by uh, operations from many different countries. Uh, I think that more research needs to be done to do a true baseline where we can say, yes, this is the average level of targeting of Americans by foreign operations of all kinds, broken down by operation, and this is how it differs for certain key communities, including veterans. My time's about expired, but I, one last question to you, Dr. Barash. I'm, I'm sure you would agree that policing this space is incredibly difficult. Has your organization witnessed any improvements or changes in the rates of fake account or scam operations thanks to the increased attention and budgets from Twitter and Facebook? Uh, thank you for the question. We have unfortunately seen an increase in these operations. I do want to recognize Twitter and Facebook's efforts at taking them down, and I think those efforts are paying off, but so far we're still in the crest of the wave. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this. It's been very informative. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rowe, for your questions. Uh, I now would like to uh, uh, recognize uh, Representative Cunningham for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, each and every one of you all, for showing up here today and answering these questions. Uh, my South Carolina district has the, the highest populations of veterans in any congressional district in the state of South Carolina. So this is a particularly important issue for me. And that's why, during the debate on the SHIELD Act last month, I introduced an amendment to require the Federal Election Commission to conduct an analysis of foreign disinformation campaigns focused specifically on influencing service members and veterans. And uh, so uh, to that extent, Mr. Kane and Mr. Gleischer, uh, you would both agree that it's your shared goal to identify and eliminate uh, veterans and veterans group pages run by foreign actors, correct? Correct. Yes, Congressman. Okay. And you agree that you have an obligation and responsibility to uh, work directly with the FEC to report such bad accounts, correct? Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Congressman, certainly whenever we identify these foreign state-backed information operations, we publicly release them for the public, for governments, for the research community um, to see and to examine that data. I, I would just add, Congressman, that when we do one of our takedowns of a foreign operation, we also work specifically with government partners, whether that is the FEC, the FBI, or others that are conducting investigations in this space to make sure they have the resources they need to do their own work, both to expose and to deter these actors. Okay, and, and who at Facebook and who at Twitter works directly with the FEC in reporting these bad actors and these foreign actors? Congressman, again, we release them to the public. Uh, I work uh, with the FEC on a number of issues and have in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Congressman, we have specific teams that work whenever we conduct one of these takedowns. We have investigators, we have policy experts, we have engineers, we have our legal teams, and we have our teams that work closely with third-party partners, like government in, uh, organizations like we're discussing. As we reach the point of understanding the nature of an operation, we'll share information proactively to make sure that our partners can conduct their own investigations, and I'm happy to follow up with more detail if that'd be helpful. Okay, yeah, so it sounds like each of you are, are responsible ultimately in communicating with the FEC and reporting these bad actors, uh, these foreign actors who are responsible for trying to interfere in our election system by targeting this misinformation campaigns to specific veterans groups. Is that right? Congressman, again, we work uh, closely with law enforcement and provide this data for all governments uh, to go through and examine this data um, so that they can examine how various communities, be it veterans communities or, or any other community, uh, how they're potentially impacted, and then we can learn from that data to help improve our service. And, and, and how many employees at each of your respective companies are, um, whose, whose job it is to root out these foreign actors um, whose intent is to impact our elections? Uh, Congressman, across Twitter, there's approximately 4,700 employees. Um, I don't have a specific number of employees available, but I'll be happy to, to get that for the record. Congressman, at Facebook, we have more than 35,000 people across the company working on safety and security. That is a number that has tripled in recent years as we've been expanding the teams to make sure we can tackle this. And within that, then, there are core teams that work closely with government and that work closely to conduct these more sophisticated investigations. And, and obviously, uh, you know, looking at the um, hindsight's 2020 and what happened in the 2016 and 2018 elections as far as targeted misinformation towards veterans and veterans groups, uh, looking backwards at uh, Facebook and Twitter's um, efforts to root out uh, foreign actors who are specifically targeting veterans and veterans groups, um, what kind of grade would you give Facebook and Twitter on their efforts? Congressman, I think we can certainly, we've certainly learned a lot since 2016. Um, with regard to specifically targeting veterans, again, we take a, a, a more holistic approach uh, and making sure that we are serving the entire public conversation and modifying our policies uh, uh, to reflect that objective. Um, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Kane. I don't have a lot of time here, but uh, I want to know whether or not you feel like there's room for ample improvement in uh, you know, helping our veterans communities to make sure that the information they're getting on Facebook and Twitter is accurate. So do you think, you know, were you all performing at a B average or a C average, or how good of a job do you feel like you're doing? Uh, Congressman, it's difficult for me to give a great work. We're constantly working to improve the service. That's something that we are never going to sit still on. We recognize that there is always more work that we can do, and we're committed to working with the VSOs and working with the research community to better understand these threats so that we can improve our service. So it is a constant state of improvement that we're working on. Mr. Gleischer. We've said pretty clearly, Congressman, that we were far too slow to recognize the threats and respond to them, particularly in 2016. The most encouraging indication in 2018, the nature of this threat is really a whole of society challenge. One of the things we saw in 2018 was we saw industry, our partners at Twitter and ourselves really focused in stepping up to this challenge, but we also saw key partners in civil society and in government who worked together, and one of the reasons there were three separate attempts that we identified and that the broader community identified to target that election directly, that the community responded to, I think, quite effectively, there's always room for improvement. Okay. There's a now, lot of more, more, more work to be done, Congress. Okay, and I'm out of time, but I appreciate your attention to this, this press matter, and I yield back. Yeah, gentlemen, time is up. Um, Mr. Belarakis, you recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing. I think the ranking member as well. Uh, 
Well, let me just say this. Uh, when, when we get these comments on Facebook, uh, for example, specifically that uh, veterans' benefits or a particular benefit uh, for a veteran is, uh, is being cut or, uh, completely, what have you, uh, if you see that this happens multiple times, uh, and, and you know, when you say something, uh, a lie over and over and over again, people start believing it, unfortunately, particularly in our game. Uh, and we're kind of uh, thick-skinned to this, but so I'm thinking about the veterans. Uh, is there any kind of a mechanism where you can uh, you can control something like that if you see, uh, you know, that the, the Congress is cutting veterans' affairs by a certain amount of money, and the opposite is true is true because uh, you know we've significantly increased the veterans' budget over the years in a bipartisan manner. Uh, is there any kind of a mechanism to uh, to take that off of uh, Facebook, Twitter, or what have you, any social media. Congressman, um, we found that you need multiple mechanisms in place working together to be as effective as possible. Let me describe two that we would use in a situation like that. First, often we see people who seed or share this type of information are doing it using inauthentic or deceptive behavior. They're concealing who they are, they're hiding their identity, or they're trying to mislead users into thinking they're someone they're not. If we see that type of behavior, we remove it from the platform. Okay, so you have that capability. We do. And Congressman. if you see it over and over and over again, you remove it because it's harmful to the, the veteran. Okay, emotionally. I, uh, Mr. Uh, Gleicher, I understand that earlier this year, Facebook worked with a committee to help verify, the, uh, verify veteran service organizations. Despite this, my staff and I found that the, the Vietnam Veterans of America, the VSO that shares the witness stand here this afternoon, their Facebook page does not have the blue verification check mark that some of its counterparts have. Can you explain why this is and, and tell us uh, how the verification process works, if that's fine, if you can? And, uh, and is, is, is Facebook going to verify these uh, VSO pages? Congressman, I can't talk too much about how the verification process works in public. We okay. know that people I might use that, that to try to game it. Okay. But I will say I'd be more than happy to work with our colleagues at VVA um, and to follow up with you, Congressman, to make sure that we review that and can address that. Okay, yeah, please, uh, you know, I want to know, maybe I'll, I'll hear from uh, Mr. Goldsmith. Uh, you say in your testimony when you found that the imposter organization using the logo in 2017 you went through Facebook's reporting features to address the problem, but that did not uh, they didn't address it, the underlying issue until Congress got involved. However, I know verification is a helpful way for members to differentiate between authentic and inauthentic process. So uh, when you uh, got in contact with their team, did you request official Facebook verification uh, on the page? Now, you know, we're, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, asking questions uh, just to get you in trouble. I want to find out what's going on. We're trying to protect the veterans. Uh, and, and I know the verification is a, is a blue check mark. Uh, so if you could answer that question and give us as much information as possible, we'd appreciate that. Thank you, Congressman. So uh, currently, Facebook has two different levels of verification. There's a gray check mark and a blue check mark. It's my understanding that the gray check mark, which is um, a surface level verification, you have to have a business address, a phone number, an email, um, and I, I think pick up the phone when they call it. Um, as for getting the blue check mark, I don't know how that would work. The way that we got our blue check mark from Twitter is I know someone who works on the policy staff personally, and last Vietnam Veterans Day I said, hey, it'd be a great thing for Vietnam vets to get their verification badge. Now, how does the blue check mark work? Uh, Facebook, please. Uh, sir, for Twitter, uh, the verification process is currently uh, on hold right now, um, but we do still verify a number of government accounts, uh, uh, elected officials, um, uh, folks like that, and we're certainly happy to work with this committee as well as the VSOs and the VA to ensure that if there are any remaining VSOs that need to be verified, that we do so promptly. Right. Anyone else? Facebook, please. Um, Congressman, 
the <clears throat> blue check mark involves additional work to verify and ensure that the organization is who they say they are, I'm happy to work with, as I mentioned, Congressman, I'm happy to work with. So in addition to the gray check mark, yes, the blue is uh, further verification. Yes, Congressman. Okay, very good. All right, I guess uh, I've ex my time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Barakas. Uh, Mr. Lamb, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Leitcher uh, from Facebook, do I have it right that your that Facebook's quarterly profits in the third quarter were a record all-time high of seventeen point seven billion dollars with a B? Congressman, I don't know the specific number, but that sounds correct. I believe your last two quarters were both record quarterly profits. This one of seventeen point seven billion, and last quarter ending in July about. Uh, seven billion. So, um, Mr. Goldsmith, thank you for your hard work on this report, and you make some specific recommendations uh, in it as to what we as Congress should do and what we should do across the government, and also what some of these specific platforms should do. Um, in light of the massive, massive profits that Facebook is making with its product, driven almost entirely by the advertising that they sell and their ability to micro target it. Do you think they're even close to doing enough to address this problem and deal with the fake accounts? Do you think more resources could be directed in that way? Since the publication of my report, um, I, I've actually had a great relationship with these companies. And one of the things that, I'm, um, that I hope comes out of, of this hearing today is I hope that we consider them American assets and, and victims. Um, it is... Uh, right to to blame and uh, assign guilt, um, but this is going to take a whole of society response. Um, and basically, what it comes down to is we're asking for them to be the police force, and they don't have in any sort of enforcement mechanism. If they can't do anything that brings the pain to the human being sitting behind the anonymous avatar, there's no real incentive for that person, that human being, that bad actor, to stop what they're doing. Do you, as part of those discussions, did you learn how much Facebook invests in the specific problems that you're addressing in this report? No, the, uh, things like a, a budget and costs, those are beyond us. Um, the one thing that I did include in my testimony is that during the two years of investigation uh, and in producing this report, VBA has essentially acted as a, an unpaid consultant for these companies. Um, that is something that I, I understand uh, could change. Um, I know Facebook has uh, partnerships with some nonprofit organizations that uh, produce reports um, to basically raise attention to threats, um, but that's above my pay grade. Thank you. Um, Mr. Barash, your, or Dr. Barash, I'm sorry, your graduate work is in this. Your expertise is about the spread of these false ideas and, and misimpressions. Do you believe there is more <clears throat> that entities like Facebook could be doing as far as investing in new solutions, whether technological or just pure manpower, particularly given the resources that they have? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, again, want to recognize that uh, we have come a long way since this problem uh, of disinformation has uh, arrived on the public scene in 2016. In 2016, there were, for instance, no terms of service by any of the major platforms that addressed this. There were very few investigators uh, at any of these companies, and there were no public data sets. All of that has changed. Uh, I do think that the companies uh, should continue their work in releasing public data sets and on public outreach and education, especially when targeting some of these more advanced campaigns. It is uh, great that we are learning about general information operations, but um, I think we can say and do even more to work with specific communities being targeted by them. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gletcher, last question, I'm about to run out of time. How much does Facebook spend on this specific problem set in terms of um, paid employees, 
investments in the AI and tech tools that you've talked about that help you detect what's going on? Congressman, what we've seen is that actors that target veterans target other communities as well, and the overlap between them means that rather than focusing on specific communities in terms of building resources, we don't want to silo the work that way. Yeah, I'm so I'd mean on the overall problem, of which this is an example. So on the overall problem, I mentioned that we have more than 35,000 employees working in this space. We currently spend more money today each year than the company made in profits the year that it IPO'd. Very, very large amounts, Congressman. Do you know the amount? I don't have the exact amount for you, Congressman. I'd be happy to talk about that further if that would be useful. The key question for us isn't do we have enough resources? The question is how can we most effectively deploy what we can get to make sure that we tackle this problem? We have and we drive. Okay, I'm glad that's the question for you. My question was whether you do have enough resources. So we'll see if we can find that out. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Uh, Mr. Boast, uh, Mr. Boss, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, because I had some prepared questions, but they've already been asked. But I do want to know, as you're going down these paths, and all of a sudden you pick up these bad, and this is this is for both uh, Twitter and Facebook, you pick up these bad actors. Okay, they they have an identity uh, on their site, whether it's a whether it's a group or organization or an individual. How after you take them down, how quick can they come back up and you identify them again? Or is there a way to block them and identify them as they move from what you blocked to someplace else? Congressman, thank you very much for that question. Um, you're absolutely right. We've made significant investment in serving the public conversation by removing these bad actors and then keeping them off platform. Um, I mentioned my opening uh, statement. It was you know, approximately 520 million challenges um, over from, from January 2018 until July of this year, um, of which approximately 75% were, were, were permanently suspended. We want to work to keep those bad actors off the platform. So as part of our, our, our overall health uh, initiatives, um, we're, we're investing in just that and making sure that we understand how to keep these bad actors off platform um, because that's how we ensure the health of the conversation. That's something that's a, a top priority for us. All right. Congressman, I would say, I mentioned in my opening remarks this notion of adversarial design. If all we were doing was takedowns, was removals, we would be in a constant game of cat and mouse. Right. So our strategy has been, over time, we remove these actors from the platforms. And as Kevin mentioned, we also have systems to keep them off when they are removed. We see them try to defeat them. We improve those systems to block them. With but Without getting too technical, OK, do you identify their um, their address, or how is it that you identify them? The most effective thing that we've seen, Congressman, is to look at the pattern of behavior that they engage in. Okay. As you, I'm, we have to be careful about talking about too many of the signals in detail, and I'm happy to talk more about them mm -hmm. in more detail in a more private setting, but you can see from the patterns of behaviors that they engage in, the types of accounts these are, and that allows us to take action. A good example of this, we have an automated machine learning system that we've been using particularly for financial scams that we've been testing and expanding to look at the pattern of behavior we see these accounts engage in. That system has identified more than 500 million and blocked more than 500 million of these accounts automatically. So that's an instance of trying to find these patterns and get ahead of them. And I guarantee you that everybody sitting here wants to make sure the veterans are protected, but they want others to be protected too. The question I also have then is, as you're moving forward, is there a danger of giving up someone else's freedom of speech that may not be in the business of doing fake uh, sites and, and, and causing trouble? Congressman, I think that's a really difficult balance to strike, and it's why it's important to be so deliberate here. I'll give you a good example. We certainly see actors from certain parts of West Africa being very prolific in this environment. But we also see people from West Africa who have legitimate reasons to engage with veterans and people who are overseas. And so we would never, for example, rely on only one signal. Okay. That's why the pattern of behavior is so valuable. Because if you have one marker, you may know something, but you can't be certain. And there's a risk that you're going to silence an innocent user. But if you see a consistent, persistent pattern of behavior, it allows us to have much higher confidence and ensure that we're not silencing innocent users. Um, I also need to ask, Mr. Goldsmith, you said that, that you've been working with them and you've become pretty well partners in trying to, to fix this problem. 
what's the law? And this, this, is, this is an answer I don't know that you can give, but I'm going to ask anyway. When this damage occurs to our veterans, it isn't like, oh, well, once this is blocked, it's over. They're still reeling from that. What is your organization doing to, one, stop, educate, first off, our veterans and the people that you work with as, your, as a VSO, but also, what do you do after the damage has occurred maybe to an individual who's a veteran that we can do through our VSOs to, to help them? Uh, thank you, Congressman. So Facebook is actually one of our primary ways of interacting with our members. We use Facebook and Twitter to educate our members. Um, since we began this investigation, any time that the press has reported on especially veteran-specific spoofing or financial scams, romance scams, et cetera, we post those on social media. We also have traditional uh, a print magazine that we publish uh, all year round. So um, we're partnering with uh, the Yale Veterans Legal Services Clinic. We have a couple of law students here who have been helping us develop policies on, on education. And we hope that this goes, uh, maybe the uh, veterans community is, is kind of a, a place where a larger picture can be born um, across American society. Thank you. With that, my time's expired. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bost. Uh, uh, Ms. Underwood, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Takano. I appreciate the system-wide steps that Facebook, Twitter, and the other companies have announced to, to tackle this complicated issue. But as the companies continue to work on it, veterans need to be able to engage with them, especially since your companies are relying so heavily on users to report bad behavior. Mr. Gleischer, you've uh, said in your testimony that Facebook has set up a dedicated escalation channel for victims of impersonation to contact Facebook to ensure that Facebook can respond quickly. So how long on average does it take for Facebook to respond to users impacted by impersonation? Thank you, Congresswoman. There are a couple of different ways someone can report to us. I understand they, the method. I want to know how long. Congresswoman, if someone reports to us on the platform, they can report immediately within the platform. We, I, we examine and respond to that, and it happens very quickly in an order of days, but I can't give you an exact timeline. Will you submit that in writing to our committee and follow-up? I'm happy to follow up with more details. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Kane for Facebook, how long does it take to respond to users uh, impacted by impersonation? Congresswoman, I don't have a specific time frame, but I'll be happy to follow up in writing for the record. Okay. Uh, what about how soon in the reporting process would it be possible for a veteran who's a victim of impersonation to speak directly with a Facebook and Twitter employee? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, certainly we have an online reporting flow. Um, as a veteran myself, I've worked extensively with a number of veteran service organizations sure. in the VA as well. I appreciate um, that. But, how, but, how long does it take to speak to an employee? Or is that not part of your process? Uh, typically, it is not part of the process okay, for us to be effective you. at Twitter. scale. Mr. Kane, are you or Mr. Gleischer? Sorry, Congresswoman. So, for example, if something is reported by one of our expert partners, mm -hmm. like VVA, we are able to work with them very quickly to respond and get in direct contact. If someone is uh, reporting directly through the platform, th then they will get an immediate they will get an immediate response. And depending on what happens, we might engage with them further. This is why I'm saying there's sort of different ways to report, so the I understand. speed is a little different. But it, will, would it be possible to speak directly with an employee, or is it just through like some kind of sus customer service line? There's not an ability to engage on the phone. It depends on how it's reported, Congresswoman. So there are different mechanisms to report. For the largest, most scaled mechanism directly on the platform, it's run through automated systems and through okay. uh, online systems for more tailored reporting like we Thank have you. with key partners. Do you maintain or publish data on the amount of time it takes to process impersonation cases from report to account closure for Facebook and Twitter? Uh, no, Congresswoman. Uh, uh, we do publish uh, twice a year a transparency report that provides this data um, overall, and, and again, for the first half of this year, we, we permanently suspended approximately 125,000 accounts for engaging in impersonation, um, but, uh, but we, we typically do not provide a specific time frame. That's something I'm certainly happy to discuss with our team to, to, as we work to provide more transparency right. around our actions uh, to examine uh, uh, the feasibility in doing right. that. Right. Uh, Facebook? 
Congresswoman, we also publish a periodic transparency report with details on enforcement. We don't include specific details on timeline. Okay, well, I think that that might be something that it might be worthwhile to consider for both companies moving forward, given the scale of this problem in our country uh, and the way that it has really spread through multiple lines of victims. The New York Times has reported that many veterans who report imposter accounts receive automatic applies from Facebook and their photos don't get removed. Uh, and some known fakes that the Times reported to Instagram weren't taken down because Instagram said they didn't violate company policies. And so Facebook has a misrepresentation policy that's pretty short, it's about a page long. Does Facebook have any additional or internal guidance beyond this policy that's publicly released that reviewers use when making decisions about whether to remove an account impersonating a veteran? Congresswoman, that is the core of our misrepresentation policy. As you might expect, there is some details that if we were to release it publicly, there's a risk that bad actors would use that sure. to name our systems. Can you share that internal guidance with our committee? I'm happy to talk further about that, Congresswoman. I, you, will you be willing to share the guidance? with our uh, committee. Congresswoman, if, uh, what I would like to do is talk to our team and make sure we can share with you what is going to be most useful for you and that we, we focus it so that we don't provide any risk of exposing anything. Okay. Um, if a veteran's request to have an imposter account using their photos is taken down, if that's denied, do they have an option to appeal on both of your platforms? Uh, broadly, yes, Congresswoman. We do okay. have an appeal. Thank you. Uh, Facebook? Yes, Congresswoman, we have okay. broad appeals processes. And then, Mr. Kane, uh, in response to one of my colleagues, you mentioned that Twitter has suspended its verification now. My question is, why are you doing that heading into an election year? Uh, Congressman, this was an action that was taken uh, in November of 2017. Certainly, as we prepare for the election, similar to what we did in 2018, we're absolutely working with a number of parties, both political parties, uh, uh, DHS, uh, the Association of Secretary of State, among others, to ensure election officials are, in fact, verified and working with them to deal with any impersonation cases as they come up. I see. Okay, so social media is an important way for veterans to stay connected to their families and to the community of veterans. It's also an important and influential source of information for veterans and non-veterans alike, which is why it's so important that we all do everything that we can, everything that we can to protect our veterans, our communities, and our country from these threats. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Underwood. Mr. Dr. Dunn, you're recognized for five minutes. Dr. Dunn here. It's not Dr. Dunn. Um, Mr. Banks? Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in 2012, Mr. Tony Wang, the general manager of Twitter in the UK, declared Twitter to be the, quote, free speech wing of the free speech party. I'm concerned that that's no longer the case. This reality has meaningful consequences for veterans and for the health of our democracy. This past February, Quillet published the research findings of Mr. Mr. Richard Hananea, who uncovered a systematic pattern of politically motivated censorship on Twitter. From 2006, when Twitter was founded to May 2015, Hananea could find exactly zero cases of prominent political persons being suspended or banned from the platform. Just over two years later in December 2017, the number of monthly suspensions of prominent political persons skyrocketed to nine times higher than May of 2015, and found that prominent conservatives were at least four times more likely than liberal persons to be found in violation of Twitter's applied terms of services and banned. While Twitter censors lawful political speech, veterans remain targets of fraud, as this hearing has already well established. According to the AARP, veterans are twice as likely to fall victim to scammers as the population at large scammers who operate on various platforms, including Twitter. Yet Twitter faces no legal consequences when veterans are harmed by activities that take place on their platform. That's because Twitter's claim that there is no possible way to moderate illicit content, such as veteran scams, in real time is protected under Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act. So Mr. Kane, isn't it quite ironic how can Twi that, Twitter, that Twitter can argue in good faith that their Section 230 protections can be retained because it does not have the resources or ability to root out illicit material, such as scams targeting veterans, on its platform when the same platform devotes considerable resources 
and attention to st uh, stomping out lawful political speech? Congressman, thank you for that question. Um, as I mentioned, we have a clear policy addressing scams on our platform, and since January 1st of this year, we permanently suspended 335,000 accounts for engaging in scamming behavior, not just for the veterans community, but for all community, because again, we have to take a very broad approach in terms of how we combat these threats, which we take seriously. Uh, to your earlier point regarding uh, uh, political speech on Twitter, Twitter's purpose is to serve the entire public conversation not just for one political party, but for the, for the entire globe. And one of the things I'm most proud of in terms of working at Twitter is we embrace diverse, diversity and diverse viewpoints, and everyone, whenever we go in to make any policy decision, we all make decisions in the interest of serving the public conversation and not one particular ideal or another. All right, all right. Mr. Glicker, in your, in your testimony, you alluded to working with law enforcement as they find and prosecute the scammers who engage in impersonation or other deceptive activities. Does Facebook have a specific process for reporting instances of veterans scamming to federal law enforcement agencies? Congressman, we work with law enforcement to report the threats that we see in a few different ways. When we see scams, particularly recurrent scams where we see someone being targeted, we will work with law enforcement to make sure they have as much information as we can provide. Whenever we see a more scaled foreign operation, for example, something emanating from what could be a nation state, we share that information proactively to make sure law enforcement understands the scope and can take action where appropriate. It's safe to say that you don't have a specific process specific for veterans. Uh, Congressman, we have processes, and what we found that's most important is the tight relationship between the people who work with law enforcement to make sure that sharing happens most effectively. Okay. So the How about this? Can you confirm that Facebook refers 100% of known instances of veteran scamming to law enforcement officials? Congressman, whenever we see particularly a ongoing or sophisticated operation, we share that with law enforcement. But if it's not sophisticated, you don't? We work with them to give them as much information as they can use. I think you've answered my question. Mr. Glicker, you stated that Facebook has dedicated escalation channels through which individuals and organizations most impacted by impersonation attempts can contact it when they learn of a new case of impersonation or targeting. In essence, the establishment of these channels are Facebook saying that it can't catch everything itself and the user has some level of responsibility. So can you help me understand what my responsibility is to track down a fake at Rep Jim Banks account? Congressman, the reason we have reporting systems is so that if someone sees something, they can get it to us quickly. We proactively investigate to remove these operations. We also build systems like transparency in place to make it easier for users and uh, teams like the team at VVA to find and, and action these things. What we've found is we can be most effective when we work closely with civil society organizations and governments. I get it, it's my responsibility. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Uh, uh, I now recognize Mr. Bendisi for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gleischer, in your testimony, you said that Facebook works hard to limit the spread of spam and other content abuses on your platform, and that you have human review and automated detection as two ways that Facebook, uh, Facebook does this. Uh, you mentioned that Facebook has over 35,000 people working on safety and security to ensure inappropriate or graphic content is not able to stay posted. How many of these people are content moderators? Congressman, I don't have a specific number for you within that 35,000, in part because we actually have policy experts that also step in on content moderation for particularly challenging cases, but a very large number of that set are focused on content moderation to make sure we have the resources we need. Would the number 15,000 be in the ballpark of content moderators? People actually viewing what's on the screen and making determinations whether or not to take it down? Congressman, I'm happy to follow up and speak in more detail for specific numbers. Okay, if you could do that in writing to the committee, I'd like to know exactly the number of content mon moderators. Um, as you know, individuals we have seen that uh, use your platform will find numerous ways to circumvent uh, your detection software. So in many ways, content moderators are the last line of defense. And the number that I think has been reported publicly is that you're employing somewhere around 15,000 individuals to ensure community compliance across the platform of about 1 billion Facebook users. Um, if that is the number, and we will wait and see what, what you come back with, does that seem like an adequate number to you, 15,000 
moderators for over one billion users on Facebook? Congressman, we can always do more, but part of our approach here is pure human moderation by itself will never scale to be enough to tackle a challenge like this. We need also automated systems that help triage and, in, and sort of empower those moderators. So we have both AI-enabled systems, and then we have content moderators, and then we have proactive detectors, investigators that hunt for more sophisticated operations. We need all of these pieces in order to be able to deal with this challenge. Do you have any plans to hire more, more humans, more content moderators? Uh, Congressman, we're continually expanding our teams. There's a reason that the, the number of people we have working in this space has more than tripled in recent years. I expect that to continue to grow. Um, I'm sure you're aware, Mr. Gleischer, a, a family from, from my district in, in Utica, New York, suffered an unimaginable loss when their daughter, Bianca Devins, was murdered on July 14, 2009. And the alleged perpetrator then posted extremely graphic and disturbing images of the crime on social media. Uh, and these images reportedly appeared more than a week later on Facebook. I use this as a case, uh, as an example of how the system Facebook has in place clearly failed at the expense of my constituents. So if content moderators are not adequately trained or are not able to keep up with workload, these tragedies will continue to occur. Can you speak to the training process of content moderators? Congressman, what happened to Ms. Devins is a complete tragedy. And the fact that people use uh, platforms designed to build community to glorify that is completely unacceptable to us. What we see here, though, there are two pieces that are relevant. First is the immediate response to identify and remove the photograph. The second challenge is we see, as we saw in this case, groups of people actually work actively to try to spread and share that photograph by recutting it by editing it, and by sharing tips amongst themselves on how to beat the automated systems we have in place. Right. I understand that. But in terms of if I'm a content moderator, I'm employed by Facebook, what training do I go through to become a content moderator? Congressman, we have a whole series of training that we go through with content moderators to ensure that they understand both what the policy lines are and how they can take both quick action but also deliberate action. I'm happy to follow up with more details on those and talk about them if that's helpful. That would be great. If you can do that to the, to the committee, that would be very helpful. Um, I, you know, obviously, there, there, there must be accountability of users on Facebook and other social media platforms who, who violate uh, your company's community standards in, in such a despicable way, um, such as purposefully deceiving veterans or sharing graphic content. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what you will do to either permanently ban users who share these images and to the best of your ability restrict uh, their IP addresses, users' IP addresses from uh, assessing the app under a different account? Congressman, whenever we see inauthentic behavior, deceptive behavior, we remove that account from the platform and we do permanently ban it. I would be careful here only because in some cases you can imagine someone sharing this to condemn it or a reporter mistakenly, sh mistakenly sharing it to report on it. Both of those are cases where we would remove the content because it clearly violates our policies, but it's not entirely clear we should fully ban an individual like that. How do you make that determination then? Uh, in a context like that, this is why we think both about behavior and about content. If we see content that violates, we take action against the content. If we see repeat behavior, that's an indication that the actor behind it is in fact bad intentioned and we take more aggressive action against the actor, for example, removing the account. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mordesi. Uh, I now uh, recognize Ms. Radawagon for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goldsmith, you raise serious allegations that foreign governments are targeting veterans. As you know, the House Permanent uh, Select Committee on Intelligence held hearings on this issue earlier this year. Have you worked with the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, and what are they doing to address the concern you've raised? I have shared uh, my report with the staff of the Intelligence Committee. Um, part of the problem is I'm also a full-time student, um, so I haven't been able to do the follow-up that I would like to with other members, other committees. Um, I will thankfully graduate in May, and after then I, I plan on talking to every committee that's going to listen. Mr. Gleischer, during committee staff briefings, you highlighted that Facebook has found that scams are originating almost entirely from non-state actors, while disinformation is mostly state actors. Is that correct? 
and how does that information inform your policies? Congresswoman, what I would say is when we see fraudulent, the majority of the activity that we see online is fraudulently motivated, that is motivated in order to make money. We're a little careful. In order to prove that something is state, it has state backed, we have very strict controls internally so that we only claim that something is state backed when we can prove it. And the reason is, particularly the state actors in this space, we've taken action against a number of operations from Russia, Iran, and elsewhere. Part of their goal is to make themselves appear more powerful than they are and make us think that every instance of misinformation is actually a foreign operation. And they do that because it fundamentally undermines our trust in the conversations we're having, and it leads to this phenomenon today where people think that anyone who disagrees with them or they distrust online may be state-backed. And so we're very careful. It's really important that people understand the nature of this threat, but we also want to make sure that we don't hyperbolize it that people know when there is a state actor, and that's why whenever we see one of these operations, we report it publicly every time, we disclose it, we provide details and analysis on the behavior we saw, and what we can prove about who was behind it, and then we share information from it with a third-party research organization, maybe Graphica in some contexts, the Digital Forensics Research Laboratory, the Atlanta Council, and others, so that they can provide their own independent assessment of the operation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Radawagon. I now recognize Mr. Cisneros for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goldsmith, I want to uh, thank you for your, your hard work effort, two years effort to, to putting this report together. It's, um, it's very impressive and very informative on everything that you've done. Um, as you may be aware, in March, uh, I led a bipartisan letter with my colleagues uh, to the FBI director are requesting an investigation into suspicious VSO accounts on social media that had outnumbered or that had been outlined for the Wall Street in a Wall Street Journal article. To date, I haven't received a response from the FBI um, through my office, um, has followed up on numerous occasions, and we still haven't gotten a response. Um, for the record, how many times have you requested that the FBI or other law enforcement agencies investigate these activities you documented, and what response have you received? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, this is something that I, I think is important, and I'm glad that, that you brought it up. The FBI has not responded to any, uh, any of our letters, any of our press releases to this report. Uh, as a matter of fact, we haven't received a response from any federal agency whatsoever, not the VA, not the DOD, uh, not the FEC, no one. Good. All right. Well, thank you for that. That's, uh, that's good to know that nobody is acting on this. So it, we should start acting on this. Um, you also said you work very closely with Facebook and Twitter to address the problems that you outlined in your report. Um, what are some of the things that you want these platforms to do that they have not done yet? So um, one of the things that uh, we've talked about today is the spoofing of, of certain individuals. Um, if you turn in my report to page 119, uh, there is an Army staff sergeant who is still in uniform. She's also an Instagram influencer. She has a unique name. It's kind of easy to find her and her imitations online. Um, someone like her ought to be um, paid attention to closely by Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any platform that she's using. Because right now I just looked up her name and I found over 23 accounts on Facebook alone. Um, someone like her who's on active duty, who is constantly being used as uh, bait for romance scams, uh, ought not to have to worry about being contacted by victims who are in love with her or who think that she owes them money. Hmm. Mr. Kane, um, you know, outlined in these reports and there's been numerous articles also, you know, throughout, whether it be in the Washington Post or any other periodical out there, um, that have said a lot of these the agents or, or these bad actors are coming from countries like Macedonia or, or anywhere else, or maybe Russia, that are targeting uh, VSOs or veterans, you know, pages on, on your, your, your platform. Uh, you know, if you see, a, if there's a page out there and it's being administrated from a foreign country that's targeting and it's meant towards veteran, isn't that a red flag to raise that that's something that maybe we should look into this? Congressman, certainly we look at the behavior behind these accounts. 
Um, and that is how we effectively address this issue at scale. Uh, and that's something that we've invested in heavily. As I mentioned, it's, it's resulted in approximately 97 million uh, challenges from Twitter just for the first half of this year alone. Uh, we continue to invest and look at the behavior, look at the signals behind how these accounts are behaving and potentially targeting people to include veterans. But again, we, we take a much more holistic approach so we're not just siloing certain communities and we can apply lessons learned across the board. Um, but again, it's looking at, at, at the, the signals behind the accounts as well as potential coordinated behavior. Uh, which is a very strong signal that, that accounts are engaging in, in suspicious activity and, and that would cause us to look into it further. Mr. Gleischer, the same question to you. Congressman, we have a proactive sweep, a team that has been looking explicitly for financially motivated pages that operate from overseas and target U.S. citizens. This includes veterans, but also it includes other situations where we see foreign actors targeting American citizens. Uh, we've removed thousands of financially motivated pages like this, when we see that they're engaged in deceptive behavior, when we see that they are monetizing or deceiving American citizens and particularly attempting to appear as if they're from the United States. And what do we do? Do we take those sites down? Yes, we, we hunt for them, we expose them, and when we find them, we remove them from the platform. All right, um, my time is wrapping up, but I do wanna say there was another article on there and hopefully this isn't the case and it was one situation, but there was one gentleman who really didn't get his page back or the administration back to his page until after he agreed to sell, you know, to do ads on his page, this Facebook. And I hope that was a one-time situation. It's not something that continually comes up. But with that, I, I'm out of time, so I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cisneros. Mr. Barr, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for holding this interesting hearing. Appreciate the witness's testimony and learning a lot about um, online scams here today and, and impersonation. Um, and I, frankly, was probably not a, aware that this was as widespread of a, of a problem uh, as, as, sir, your report uh, showcases here. Um, I think everybody uh, in this room, uh, I would hope, opposes scams, uh, inauthentic accounts, fraud, obviously, um, and uh, the, the terrible graphic uh, displays that, that were described earlier. And certainly, uh, we're very concerned about um, uh, scams and fraud schemes coming from, targeting our veterans coming from overseas, foreign entities. I, I do want to ask you, though, you know, how widespread is this? And let me direct this question to Mr. Kane and Mr. Uh, Gleischer. How widespread is this? Is, is this, uh, you know, in the, the, the total universe of accounts and posts on Twitter and Facebook, what is the percentage of scams of uh, targeted campaigns of, of false accounts that, in, in terms of the percentages? Uh, Congressman, every day there are more than 500 million tweets around the world on Twitter. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we actioned approximately 335,000 accounts uh, that were permanently suspended that were engaging in scamming activity. Uh, Over what time period? Uh, from January 1st to today. Okay, so you know, ballpark, uh, you know, percentage of of uh, fraudulent or fake or accounts or impersonations in the in the total Twitter universe. Congressman, I'm a former enlisted infantryman. Math is not necessarily my strong skill set, and I yeah. I'll be happy to follow up for the record uh, in terms of. I mean, uh, would you say it's rare? Uh, cer certainly, it's 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 not entirely common. Okay, and and Facebook, Mr. Gleischer. Congressman, we have a periodic transparency report. We report the fake accounts that we've removed. To give you a sense of scale, we removed about 1.7 billion fake accounts in the last quarter. The vast majority, I think 99.8% of them, we removed automatically before any user engaged with them, often within minutes of their creation. Well, that sounds like a lot, it, it, it certainly. And, um, and one is too many. Obviously, if there's a scam of, a, of our service members or a veteran, that's one is too many. Uh, but I do want to touch on this issue of if it's in the grand scheme of thing, things in, in, social, in the social media universe, um, I do worry uh, if there's ever a, a mistake that's made in removing accounts too. Uh, I think there's a balance that we need to strike. And so my question uh, as a follow-up is, have, has Twitter or Facebook ever mistakenly removed an authentic account which was misidentified as an impersonation? Uh, or does that happen all the time? 
Uh, Congressman, certainly uh, it, that is not common, but it can happen. As we, as we seek to enforce our rules at scale, um, unfortunately, there are occasions where we have made mistakes, and certainly we do uh, allow for an appeals process to address an issue where a, a, mistake, a mistake may be made. Um, yeah, and I, and, and I was interested to hear about the, the content moderators and the AI that's used. Uh, how do you all prevent in the trainings that you all conduct, how do you prevent uh, political bias from creeping into to content moderation or even your AI systems? Um, in other words, you know, w we, we obviously want to prevent scams, but we also don't want to um, have uh, viewpoint discrimination uh, based on uh, a moderator or an AI uh, systems um, uh, assessment uh, that something is politically incorrect. How do you avoid censorship is my point. Congressman, that's a great question, and that's something that we work every day to ensure that, that any content moderator understands uh, uh, that we are here to serve the public conversation and applying appropriate context in terms of making decision. At no point in time will we tolerate uh, or accept any type of bias uh, uh, when these decisions are made. And, so, and we absolutely uh, work with our workforce to ensure they receive appropriate training uh, to avoid such issues. Well, Mr. Gleischer, I mean, how would you differentiate an inauthentic account uh, or a post versus an authentic account uh, or a post that may reflect views that some may deem politically incorrect? Congressman, uh, when we're talking about inauthentic behavior, one of the essential components for us is that we're acting based on the techniques or tactics we're seeing, not based on what the person is saying. So I mentioned that we've done 50 of these takedowns over the course of the last year. All of those takedowns are based on patterns of behavior. For example, representing oneself as an American when in fact we can see the account is coming from another country has nothing to do with who the person is or what they're saying. And drawing that line is extremely important for us, particularly because of the concerns you're describing and because we know that foreign actors act, one of their techniques is to make themselves try to look American and then try to say things that are right on the line which means that if we don't take it down, they get their message out. But if we do take it down, then they get to stoke the sort of fuel, the perception of bias. And so for us, having behavioral-based enforcement is a really important component. And we couple that with clear public community standards and an appeal system, because we know we'll make mistakes to make sure that we can address them when they happen. Uh, my time has expired, but you all have a tough job. Uh, just always remember to err on the side of, of free speech and not censorship. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Uh, Ms. Rice, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gleischer, I'd just like to continue on uh, Mr. Barr's line of uh, discussion in terms of inauthentic versus authentic accounts. Last month, the New York Times reported that Facebook detected a massive new Russian disinformation campaign that was targeting parts of Africa, um, which is yet another step in Russia's relentless efforts to use social media to undermine global stability. The uniqueness of of that situation, however, was that they were co-opting African citizens to do that, which made detection of those accounts that much more difficult. And my colleague, Mr. Barr, was kind of, this kind of goes into, if, if there is no clear connection to a foreign state or non-state actor, but, the, but there is a, it looks, smells, tastes like disinformation. How do you address that? Because this is, this is where they're going, and they're doing that here in America now, prior to our 2020 elections. Thank you for the question, Congressman, Congresswoman. And you're sort of striking to exactly the heart of this challenge. I'd say two things. First is, we distinguish between disinformation, which is content that may be true or false, and inauthentic behavior. And in fact, for many of these operations, the majority of what they say is not provably false. What we're looking for is deceptive behavior and techniques. And whether you're foreign or domestic, if you're using fake accounts to mislead people about who you are, that's unacceptable. The other thing that I would say that's actually interesting and to some degree encouraging about this latest takedown. So we identified uh, multiple operations across Africa. The Stanford Internet Observatory also identified one and we worked together with them to expose this. What we found is that these actors were using locals and in some ways that could make it more challenging, but in another way it makes it a little easier because the locals don't have the sophistication, the deliberation to conceal their identity. And that type of technique 
wouldn't work very well in the United States. And the reason it wouldn't work as well is because in the US, we have law enforcement and government teams that are dedicated and focused on this challenge. So if, you, if we see foreign actors working with locals, those locals could be at significant risk of exposure. So, But you didn't see it in Africa, so how are you going to see it here, I, I guess? Congress, so we did, I think in this case, we found and proactively exposed and removed these operations. So those were ones that we found based on our own invest, there were three. Uh, two of them we found based on our own investigations. Right. One of them Stanford found. Working together, we exposed them and removed them. And in those cases, Congresswoman. No, no, go ahead. Uh, in those cases, one of the challenges is if you don't have law enforcement focused on the problem and government focused on the problem, you can operate with impunity in these countries. Right. Those operations, they used physical newspapers. They used things that were far from uh, social media platforms. That would be much more difficult here. So you're looking into that happening here as well. You're on top of that issue. We are, and law enforcement is as well, which I think is actually extremely important. Good. So uh, on that note, um, two things. Uh, how do you determine when it's uh, your content moderator is an individual versus an uh, AI system versus a proactive detector? So in the case of influence operations, these 50 takedowns that I've described over the course of the last year, every single one of them goes through multiple levels of human review. These are sophisticated threat actors. We may see some patterns that automated systems use, but these are the things where we need human investigators. And we have a team of investigators from law enforcement, the intelligence community, and actually investigative journalism. So is AI the, the, maybe the technical review and then things are kicked up for human review? Is that how it would go? Or? We've found that AI is, in this context, is particularly useful to surface patterns yeah. that help our investigators find the threats. Okay. You might imagine they're looking for needles in a haystack. AI helps shrink the haystack yeah. so they know where to look. So let me just comment on the um, content moderators because they are looking at really disturbing stuff. Their job is to look at very disturbing stuff every day. And my concern is that they are not being trained well enough, they're not being supported from an emotional standpoint, and it's clear that they're not being treated as valued employees from a compensation standpoint. And I really think it's incumbent upon Facebook to take care of those people who have, I mean, it's like PTSD, it's terrible. I'm not taking away from you, Chris, at all, but like no, that's what they are doing is unbelievably difficult. Um, also, I just have a question for Mr. Kane and for Mr. Gleischer, and I have about 13 seconds. Um, do your platforms voluntarily, you, you talked about sharing data with federal law enforcement on fraudulent accounts when such information is discovered, but do you require law enforcement to go through a legal process, i.e. issuing a subpoena, or is there some kind of an agreement? Now, I'm not asking you to violate the ECPA and give me any substantive information. I'm asking you as a process, are, is law enforcement required to go through this ridiculously time-consuming process of subpoenaing for information? Congresswoman, I would say, so there are three ways we share with law enforcement. First is they share tips with us that we then use to fuel our own investigations. There was a really critical example of this just before the midterms that was a very good example of collaboration also with Twitter and others. Second, they may come to us and ask for specific evidence about individuals. In a case like that, they need to go through lawful process and we're very careful to ensure we're protecting our users' privacy. Third, when we're investigating one of these cases, we will sit down with them and talk through strategic here are the patterns we're seeing. Here's the type of information we're seeing. And we'll have these higher level conversations that are calibrated so we're not exposing user privacy, but we can fuel their investigations and they can fuel ours. So we're trying to strike that balance. It's very similar to Twitter. And I, I'd really also like to thank um, uh, the cross industry collaboration uh, with Facebook and Google among others uh, in terms of making sure that we're all working together to share appropriate information to deal with this threat. And certainly we have a very uh, close uh, working relationship uh, uh, with our law enforcement partners as well. Well, that's clear. And, and look, today we're talking about veterans because they are a particularly vulnerable population. But every single one of us at some point in our lives is gonna have this happen to us. And so it behooves all of us to work together, whether it's the private sector, you know, civil society, government, private citizen. Thank you very much all for being here, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Uh, ranking member, Dr. Rowe, you're recognized for five minutes for any closing remarks you may have. Well, this late in the afternoon, it won't take five minutes. And I do want to thank the panel for being here. And, and the, the beauties of social media um, are that, um, that 
I have a granddaughter that's two and a half, and I literally have seen a picture of her every day of her life because of that, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. Um, the, 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 to expose to when my son, when I was overseas in the Army in Southeast Asia years ago, um, we had to send a tape uh, of, a, of a voice in. So it, it has changed, and dramatically for the better, I would add. Um, I, you know, you see the statement, uh, Roe is dumber than a flat rock. I would consider that to be uh, offensive speech that needs to be removed, and my opponents would think that, that that's political free speech. And that's the challenge you guys have of figuring out what is hate speech, what is all. You have a very, very difficult job. I would finish by saying, and Mr. Chairman, thank you. This has been a great hearing. Um, many of us in this room, I know at least two of you at that dais, have, including myself and, and Chris here, have put a uniform on, left this country to protect your right to free speech. And, and I would always err on free speech, even if I've told my newspaper editorials, when you write, if it's true, and you write it about me, it just happens to be your opinion and true. And I think that's one of the great things about America is our ability to say what we want to as Americans. And I know you have a tough job with, with the basically the, the uh, really assault that you're seeing from, from uh, bad actors from overseas. Um, but again, I would suggest that you err uh, always on an individual's liberty and free speech. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. And I'd like to close with a few final thoughts. Uh, today we've learned about a unique and growing threat from foreign actors targeting our veterans on social media in order to steal their voices, whether for spreading disinformation and political propaganda, luring unsuspecting Americans into romance scams, or simply engaging in commercial fraud. These predators are all trying to impersonate veterans or veteran service organizations. Dr. Goldsmith and Dr. Barash, Mr. Goldsmith and Dr. Barash have provided compelling testimony on the scale of these scams as well as the harm. It is notable how far, fast, and wide the impact spreads. Both Twitter and Facebook have explained their efforts to screen for such spoofed accounts, to identify bad actors, and to remove them from their respective platforms. And while I do not doubt their sin sincerity or their commitment to addressing this critical issue, I am convinced that more can and must be done to protect veterans' voices. We did not hear from law enforcement today, but an integral piece of the solution to this problem lies there. The committee is scheduling a closed briefing for our members with, uh, and staff with the FBI to learn how they and other law enforcement agencies are engaging with social media platforms. Most importantly, we need to understand what loopholes, roadblocks, and barriers are needed are impeding a more effective enforcement, a more effective enforcement and protections, and perhaps identify an opportunity for legislative action to address any policy gaps. Today's hearing has highlighted existing challenges faced by the victims of spoofing for getting fake accounts quickly identified and removed. But we have also heard from platforms, uh, from the platforms, about all the procedures and resources they have directed towards solving this problem since 2016, and yet the data show that spoofing continues to rise. So clearly, more must be done. There is room for all the parties to collaborate and share more information to address these threats in a comprehensive manner rather than the current haphazard approach. I'm committed to working with, the ranking, with ranking member uh, Roe and other members of our committee and our congressional colleagues on both sides of the aisle to continue to highlight this issue as we head toward the, towards the 2020 election. Um, again, I thank all of you for attending today. Uh, members will have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. And again, thank you to all of our witnesses for appearing before us today. Without objection, committee stands adjourned. Thank you.